بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, in this video uh, I will uh, discuss the principles and the current updates uh, of the subtrochanteric fractures in this lecture we will go through these objectives the most important is the keys to have a successful operation if we look at the subtrochanteric fractures and we think of why is it special why did it take a special name away from the diaphyseal fractures or the trochanteric fractures we will find that the definition of the subtrochanteric fractures in literatures remains controversial since fielding in 1973 was the first to describe this area as an anatomical peculiar area which is the interval between the lesser trochanter and going downwards or distally for about 7.5 cm below it. So any fractures with a fractured center in this area will be termed a subtrochanteric fractures. Usually these fractures will have an upwards or a downwards in extension, but the fracture center is located in this area of the isthmus. If we look at the hip fractures or the proximal femoral fractures, we'll find that this fracture is very common. It's about one quarter of the fractures located in the proximal femur. With a bimodial distribution of age, young, high energy trauma, elderly, low energy trauma. Young, complex fractures caused by high energy trauma, elderly, spiral fractures used by minor twisting injury due to osteoporosis. This fracture is unique, and we mean by unique that if you look at different long bones like the humerus or the tibia, you will not find a special area taken from the diaphysis to have a special consideration except in the femur, like the subtrochanteric area. So why is this area taken from the diaphysis to have a special considerations? This is due to its anatomical speciality. It's an area of great stress concentration. It has a special mechanical consideration. First, due to its muscle attachment. So above this area, you will find that all the muscles is acting in one direction, which is the abduction and the flexion and the external rotation. While below this area, all the muscles is, uh, are acting in another direction, which is the adduction and extension and internal rotation. So that, that's what we name the unbalanced muscle forces acting on a special area, which is the subtrochanteric area. The second thing is the eccentric muscle loading. So if we look at the tibia, we will find that the anatomical axis is collinear with the mechanical axis but actually in the femur the mechanical axis falls medial to the anatomical axis of the bone this is very apparent and is the reason for the vulgum angulation that happens after the fracture as well as the medial cortical complex failure that usually is that is usually accompanied uh, by high energy forces applied to this area it has a special biological consideration also beside having a mechanical considerations or a special consideration it has a very low healing power as compared with the trochanteric lesion so if we look at the trochanteric lesion this is highly vascular with high porosity can, full of cancellous bone which is liable to rapid remodeling and, and, uh, and healing. However, below this area lies the cortical bone, which, is, which has low vascularity and low porosity, and it takes a long time for healing, as well as a difficulty in consolidation. So, this fracture is unique of having a special mechanical considerations due to muscle, due to abnormal or eccentric loading, 
as well as low healing power as compared to the trochanteric area above. If we look at the classification system, we won't find in literature an ideal classification system. And when we mean an ideal classification system, we're looking for a classification system that guides the treatment or establish the prognosis. So there is no, not, no classification system, although there are many, that detects or gives a hint about the guide to treatment or the prognosis. The most commonly used is the original fiddling classification, which, is, which depends upon the anatomical location of the fracture, the Russell-Taylor classification, which depends on the entry point of different nails, other classification systems which are coming and coming more popular. It depends on the degree of comminution and the status of the medial and lateral buttress. The current treatment options, if we think of the biological and the mechanical forces uh, 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 peculiar to this area, you will, you will always think that there is no place for non-surgical treatment except in exceptional conditions. However, surgery is the standard of care. So, timing to surgery. Khan in injury in 2009, he studied the best timing for management of hip fractures and he found that the management within the first 48 hours reduces the complications and the mortality. But, as we said, these fractures either belong to a young adults with high energy trauma associated with a lot of morbidities due to its polytraumatic status, so they require a lot of time for pre-operative pre preparation, or they belong to elderly associated with a lot of morbidities that requires a long time for pre-operative preparation for the surgery. So, we, we, we recommend early fixations whenever possible, once the patient is fully prepared. The best is within the first 48 hours to achieve the best results. In the subtrochanteric fractures, we're always concerned with which implant is the best. Either use an intramedullary or an extramedullary fixation. Theoretically, the intramedullary device has a shorter lever arm so it requires a huger force for the moment. So the force applied here has to be a big force for this construct to fail or to fall on verum. However, because the lever arm of the extramedullary fixation is big or is long, so a, a lower force will lead to the same moment. So actually, the intramedullary devices, due to the shorter lever arm, theoretically has a mechanical advantage over the extramedullary devices. But if we look at what we do, we will find that this plate is actually bent and is falling into verum. And this nail also can fail. So it's not a matter of an implant. There is something missing. When we, review at the, when we review the literature to see the current evidence, we will find that a lot of papers comparing the intramedullary versus extramedullary found that functional results and complications were similar. Maybe there is some advantages for intramedullary fixation or extramedullary fixation in special situations. However, the results are not statistically significant. And most of the paper emphasized that it's about a fracture pattern or the reduction. So, although the current literature or the current trends deviates towards the long kephalomedullary nails because of their biomechanical advantages and minimally invasive fixation, however, they also fade. And the much more important is the quality of reduction and the vascularity. So it's the mechanical and the biological factors. 
And in a well-reduced fracture, the literature demonstrates that the results of intra and extramedullary fixation, preserving the biological techniques, were similar. So it's not a matter of implant, it's a matter of reduction, reduction. And if we look at this slide, you will find that the most important factor is reduction. And not only reduction, it's reduction, reduction, because you, ha you must have an accurate reduction. And we will speak, uh, we'll speak about this in the coming slides. And not only reduction, you will see that there is another ter terms like maintaining the reduction and fixation techniques. Because maintaining the reduction in these type of fractures is very difficult and you have to maintain your achieved proper reduction during the fixation technique. And the fixation technique itself, if, if done improperly, may be a displacing or a cause for displacement of the fracture. And that's what happened when you reduce your fractures and you get a proper reduction. And finally, after fixation, you're surprised with that you, the, the, the fracture uh, has displaced in spite of having a good reduction before fixation. So it's the matter of fixation. And finally, the choice of implant comes the least. Thinking about the reduction. The reduction starts with the choice of the, paper, the patient position, whether to put him on a traction table or a conventional radiolucent table, which is better. You will find in the literature that there is no consensus. However, it varies with the type of fixation, the experience of the surgeon, and the appropriate images he can get, also with the type of patient, whether he's obese or not. So let us take it one by one. First, some hints about the traction table. Usually in a traction table, we need the patient to be put in what we name the banana position. That means that his trunk should be adducted with a degree of about 10 to 20 degrees to allow for a proper entry point. The second thing is that you should have a balanced traction on both sides because if you, did, if you, if you do not apply traction to the sound limb, that means that once you apply traction to the diseased limb, the pelvis will tilt. So you have to have a balanced traction on each side. You have to put the sound side on traction and then put the other disease side to traction so that the pelvis remains in the AP view and you can have achieve we can achieve a good AP view of both hip. Also be aware that while applying the traction you're putting too much tension on the limb and you're ten you're tensioning the muscles. So what happens is that once you put the traction, the iliopsoas tensions, getting the proximal fragment into flexion and external rotation. Also, this post that it's used to stop the patient is actually, it actually acts as a lever point or a pivot at the fracture site. And once you adduct the limb to allow for a proper entry point, you're actually putting the fracture or deforming the fracture into more varum angulation. What about using the lateral decubitus position? This is very nice position for obese patients. However, it helps the fracture to fall into anti-posterior angulation as well as medial angulation. So be aware of this. However, it's very easy for obese patients to have a proper entry point on the lateral decubitus position. The problem here is always the image intensifier to have a proper AP and lateral views. That's why the surgeons prefer the supine position. But in a supine position, the traction is usually uh, done by the assistant so that's very exhausting. So that the best way is to make use of the proper entry point and the proper imaging by having an oblique lateral view, uh, uh, oblique lateral decubitus position, what we name the lazy lateral position 
So they are taking the advantage of a lateral, having a, an easy entry point in obese patients, and a supine position of having a good image views. Reduction. Reduction is the most important single factor in, your, in the prognosis. Not only reduction, also maintaining of reduction till you, you fix your fracture properly. So, what's the meaning of reduction? We have two types of reduction. Either anatomical, which is used in uh, articular fractures, and functional reduction. Functional reduction, we always refer to it as restoration of the LAR, the length, angulation, and rotation. So what's the acceptable angulation here? Angulation here, we will take it in the two planes, the coronal plane, which is the anteroposterior plane, the sagittal plane, which is the mediolateral plane, and the rotational plane. Literature had demonstrated that these planes must be less than 10% angulation in any plane to have an appropriate reduction and an acceptable reduction that means that more than 10 degrees will have a 25% revision however good reduction less than 10 degrees uh, is associated with no revision revisions and a high success so you have to restore your fracture in the AP in the AP plane and that means restoration of the proper neck shaft angle. In the lateral plane, that means that restoration of the proximal flexed fragment to the normal position, as well as restoration of the rotation, which is very difficult, and we will see how to restore it. Reduction of these fractures are very difficult, and we always advertise and advocate for an indirect reduction in diaphyseal fractures. However, Indirect reduction in these fracture types is very difficult. As we said, this is an area of great stress concentration with an unbalanced muscle pull as well as eccentric loading of the femur. So they are very liable to deformation and very hard to reduce. And not only to reduce, but to maintain the reduction. Several internal biological techniques have been demonstrated by the AO Foundation. However, if we look at the literature, we have three types of reduction, either open, closed, or mini open. We will find that the closed reduction techniques is very difficult to achieve because of the unbalanced muscle pull. And everybody knows this. However, if you can get it, this is the best because you're preserving the best biology. Open reduction is the easiest However, it's associated with high incidence of non-unions up to 20%. Remember that there is a biological problem with this area as well as the mechanical problem. And this is the challenge of the subtrochanteric fractures. There are two problems, both mechanical and biological. Therefore, the best way is to get 50% of the closed and 50% of the open. So that to achieve what we name a limited open reduction, that means that you do an open reduction with minimizing the footprints and the soft tissue stripping, preserving the biology of the fracture as much as possible. And that is done by special instruments that minimizes the footprints on the fracture site. So whether you do it open, closed, or mini open, you have to achieve proper reduction with less than 10 degrees angulation in the three planes that we spoke of. The first is the coronal plane. It's the mediolateral plane in AP view of the image. And this is done by restoration of the neck shaft angle, which is about 135 degrees. If a neck shaft angle below 120 degrees, it's abnormal and should not be accepted. This is easily restored by just abducting the limb, traction and abduction. However, the problem comes in this plane during the fixation because it depends on the entry point on fixation of the nail. So we have three entry points, the tip of the greater trochanter, 
lateral to the tip of the greater trochanter or a medial to the tip of the greater trochanter. That will happen if you go with the lateral trochanteric entry point in this type of fractures. Because if you go to the if you go through a lateral entry point and you want to put the nail into the distal fragment, that will end with a varum angulation of the neck. But it's advised to go through a medial entry point to the greater trochanter so that once you reduce the fracture, you reduce the neck shaft angle and you maintain it in the proper position. And that's why it's advised after reduction of the neck shaft angle to have a medial entry point to the greater trochanter so as to preserve and to prevent later on displacement after fixation. And this is one of the common pitfalls of this fracture fixation. The sagittal plane, which is the anthroposterior plane in the image intensifier, the most important thing is to reduce the proximal fracture, the proximal flexion angulation of the proximal fragment. And that can be done by closed manners using a pusher or a mallet on the proximal fragment or a hook using a mini open technique or sometimes we use a human inserted on the anterior part of the proximal fragment and rarely we use the nail. This method of reduction theoretically it's very it sounds however in the practical practically it's very dangerous because actually these fractures if you're using uh, uh, if you do if you're using a nail to reduce uh, the proximal fragment in an osteoporotic bone you will end with a crack in the anterior cortex and also in high energy fractures in the young uh, in the young ages Usually, there is a hidden uh, uh, extension of this subtrochanteric fracture to the proximal part, and it always appears once you use this method of reduction. So, I would I'd, I'd not advise to use the nail as a reduction tool for uh, and levering uh, uh, aggressively on this fracture uh, proximal fragment. We rely on the contour of the posterior cortex or posterior cortical line of the neck and the shaft. In the lateral view, to judge on the angulation of the fragments or the fracture after proper reduction. Rotation. Rotation is the most difficult plane of reduction. Usually, the problem of rotation appears with the with the internal rotation of the distal fragment the external rotation of the limb is somehow forgiving however internal rotation is not forgiving because the mal alignment between in the patellofemoral joint between the patella which is sublax laterally and the distal femur causing anterior knee pain in this case this was a mal rotated limb, which appears in the relationship between both patelli and the internal rotation of the foot as compared with the proximal uh, uh, part of the fracture. Rotation, in a simple words, is a restoration of the normal relationship between the proximal femur and the distal femur, what we name the femoral torsion. This relationship is about 15 degrees, an average of 15 degrees of what we name antiversion of the neck. So this, this must be restored inside the operation. An easy, an, e, an, easy, an easy judgment of the proper reduction of the rotation it to, is to get the cortical thickness equal on both sides. And that means that you reduced the, 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 rotational, the rotation of the distal fragment accurately on the proximal fragment. However, this is very useful in simple fracture patterns. In comminuted fractures where you cannot find a good cortical contact between the two fractures, 
we judge on the relationship between the distal femur and the proximal femur. So what we do is that we take an image of the hip joint on the sound side or the normal side while the patella is facing upwards. And we see how it looks, the lesser trochanter of the proximal femur on the sound side. And we try to copy this image while facing the patella upwards on the diseased side while reducing the fracture. This is a radiological method. Another cl clinical method is to restore the relationship between the patella and the anterior superior iliac spine, judging on the, that the patella should be facing upwards and should be in line with the anterior superior iliac spine. And this is a rough clinical method. The most accurate method, if you have a comminution, is the relationship of the proximal femur to the distal femur using an image intensifier. Maintaining of reduction. Maintaining of reduction is a crucial and a very difficult step here. Usually, we maintain the reduction by the footprints of the reduction tools, like, for example, the clamps, sometimes using a polar screws, sometimes using a circulage wire. The most commonly used method is the circulage wire. However, too much uh, devascularization while at applying the circulage wire is very dangerous and affects the biology of this, uh, uh, of this fracture. Studying the difference between the forceps, the polar screws, and the circulage, there was no difference regarding the quality of reduction, consolidation times, and complication, and the rate of operation. So three, th these three types works perfectly. But the most important thing is to achieve the quality of reduction, uh, the, 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 the best quality of reduction, with minimal uh, damage to the blood supply or the biology of the fracture. Last, the choice of the implant. The intramedullary nails has a, a mechanical advantage, as, as we said, over the uh, plates. However, the entry point of the medullary nail is crucial, as the medullary nail can be a tool to displace the fracture while fixing it. So remember that in this type of fracture, the proximal diaphyseal fracture or the subtrochanteric fractures, the preferred entry point is to enter medial to the greater trochanter to avoid varum angulation of the fracture and putting high stresses on this fracture. Which nails? We have two types of nails. The reconstruction style nails with the two sm with two small diameter proximal screws or the proximal femoral nails with a large central lag screw the two small diameter screws they causes no weakness at the place of their entry through the nail preserving the nail strength however their weakness they are weak not like the lag central screw the lag central screw because of its strength, it shares in taking some forces that's applied to the hip, protecting the cancellous bone and the fracture. These two types of screws, they are not load sharing. So most of the stresses will be shared, will be loaded by the proximal fracture. So we recommend in a stable fracture pattern, that means that you have a good cortical buttress, medial. Both nails will work the same. But if you have an unstable fracture with a comminution medially, or a fracture in an osteoporotic bone, it's preferred to use the strong central leg screw so as to take some forces and to protect your fracture. It's preferred because of the working strength of the nail is to use generally long nails in this type of fractures, preserving or passing the fracture proximally and distally as long as possible. This is a must, especially in poor bone quality. 
Concerning extramedullary devices, it's preferred because of the common comminution that we always see on the medial cortex to, fair, to, to use an angular stable plates, a locked devices. The DCS, our locked DCS, provides a very good chance for angular stability as well as a proximal good purchase by using a central big lag screw and purchase into the head. This will prevent the varum angulation of the fracture being a, uh, an angular stable plate. However, the most important factor for using a plate is having a biological technique, preserving the biology in this area with low and precious vascularity. With all these recommendations, and implant fixation technologies. Even today, the complication rates for this type of fracture still is high. Infection, loss of reduction and implant failure with non-union is the most common encountered complication in this precious or peculiar area. So, the surgical decision making depends on the expertise of the surgeon and there is a lot of variability on the fracture pattern in the patient uh, 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 body built that will change the expert opinion of the surgeon concerning the positioning the reduction techniques and the implant selection however the principles of surgical or, or, or the keys of success will remain the same in all patients reduction maintaining the reduction proper fixation techniques to avoid displacement and finally the choice of the implant comes the law comes the last and not the first in simple fractures it's advised to achieve the best reduction possible either by open closed or preferable a midway between which is the mini open or open with biological technique Fixation here is done by plates or nails. Both have are good options. It's preferable in fractures with a trochanteric extension to use uh, plates to preserve the entry point of the nail. However, in complex fractures, nailing is the best option. Preserving the biology is a must. A short case presentation about the subtrochanteric fractures. This is a case, 40 years old male, isolated high energy trauma, leading to a spiral, simple subtrochanteric fracture. The surgeon here did not apply principle of the proper reduction and the maintenance of reduction so he tried to reduce it closed and used only one circulage wire to maintain the reduction and inserted the nail through a wrong entry point leading to varum angulation of the nail. And this is the result of improper reduction, improper maintenance of reduction, improper fixation technique, and improper choice of the implant. After 10 days, of fracture operation, the end result was a comminuted subtrochanteric fracture with proximal extension and fracture of the greater trochanter. What we did is that we opened the fracture, removed the nails, reduced it properly, maintained the reduction with minimal footprints using three circulage wires, redoing the entry point to make it more medial and then inserting our final fixation device. And this is the follow up after healing of the fracture after three months and the patient is capable of full weight bearing. Our take home messages are it's an area of great mechanical stress concentration. It's an area of poor bone biology. No idea classification exists. 
surgery is best as soon as possible, preferably within the first 48 hours. It's not a matter of an implant. Both implants prove in literature to work or to perform well. The reduction and the maintaining the reduction as well as the proper fixation technique and not device are the keys to success. Thank you.